G'day, I'm Adam Hills, coming to you from my Melbourne garage where I'm recording my UK TV show, The Last Leg. Now, COVID-19 has pulled the rug from under every performer. But tonight on Australian Story, you're going to see some entertainers who are dealing with the situation in a novel and positive way. There are the familiar Aussie actors who are filming their own self-isolation rom-com without leaving their houses. There's the Australian country music star who's dealing with the cancellation of her gigs in her own unique way. But first, there's a group of blokes from Mullumbimby whose fake Russian choir has gone viral in Russia during the pandemic. They're called the Dostoevskys and they have to be seen to be believed. And from what I understand, Ita Zdorava, which I think means it's great in Russian. <laughs> Here is Dostoevsky, live in Brunswick Heads. Special isolation performance for Australian Broadcasting Collective. We sing together apart, just over 1.5 metres, to be sure. A Russian choir out of a bunch of men that don't speak Russian. It's kind of bizarre, but it works. Dostoevsky is the leading genuine fake Russian choir in Southern Hemisphere. We are 28 men, middle-aged, very hairy, and we all live outside the tiny little hamlet of Malambimbi, or as we call it, Malamgrad. It turns out that we are the choir fit for pandemic. Еще о музыке любительский хор из Австралии, прославившийся исполнением русских песен, набирает. And then suddenly they got contacted by Russian TV, and I don't think they were quite prepared for their reaction. It was like they got to be like a boy band suddenly, boy band for old people. Русские классические песни совершенно не знаю. So we make clip for interwebs. Russian TV jazz it up, and it go crazy over there. The irony of going viral during uh, COVID-19 in Mother Russia. We cannot get enough of it. We, we are choir born for pandemics. Most infectious choir on the planet right now. <laughs> Comrade Glenn, he is big boss. Strong, silent type. Dostoevsky is his troubled love child. Glenn Wright is one of the founders of Dostoevsky. He has a long history in the music industry from back in Sydney of the Harborside Brasserie. And he's just really great at seeding ideas and, and making them happen. I moved up north to Mullumbimby and um, I started the Mullumbimby Music Festival. I came up with this idea of putting together a Russian choir with locals. I've had a, a long-standing love affair with the music of Russia. There's just this incredible tradition. The Russian people are kind of edgy, I think. But I just love the passion, and I think that that's what the choir tries to create. Cheers, Tommy. Cheers. Cheers. Ah, Prost, whatever it is. <laughs> I was having a beer with my friend Tom Whitaker, Comrade Whitaker. It was great. Yeah. Tom said, well, we need to find someone to lead us musically and suggested Andrew Swain. I was at a party with Glenn and Tom and it was two o'clock in the morning and we were drinking vodka and that was when they asked me. <laughs> well, I was pretty much anybody's at that stage. And then the next morning I woke up and I went, oh, Russian. <laughs> and away we went. <laughs> Andrew Swain has a long history in choirs. He is a choir master himself. He couldn't get someone better to be doing the arrangements. When we get louder, not to speed up, just relax, you know, like, give it all, but don't race in. Um, when we started the group, I didn't audition anybody. Um, I do come from a background where I do believe that everybody can sing. 
<laughs> Who knew parking was a problem in Mullum, huh? <laughs> Mark Swivel came along and he was new to town and kind of new to the choir. I don't know how he got in because it was pretty tough, but he was exactly the right person and the right fit. Now, each of the Dostoevskis live alone in shipping container. We do many things for workings. Uh, most of the boys work in typewriter factory. Uh, some of them are salmon smokers. Of course, we make the gherkin liqueur. That is how uh, we live our life. We make most of our money from that. We do a little bit sing song now for the good people of Malamgrad. Swiv's a lawyer, but he's also a comedian. He brought humor and uh, a dynamism to the show. What do we think of the red gherkin beer, boys? What do we think? Is good? Oh. Oh. That is absolute seal of approvals right there. We did our first gig at the 2015 Mullum Music Festival and it went really well. It felt like we were Russians. In fact, some of the people in the audience thought we were Russian, which we all got a kick out of, and it was, the original idea was that that would happen. <laughs> massive reaction right from the outset. They got other gigs, you know, other festivals wanted them to come and perform there. But they had to be really careful. Like, they couldn't grow too quickly because they only had three songs. <laughs> and it was kind of then that the momentum of Dostoevsky um, just started to roll. And we got invited to sing at the Fringe in Sydney. Then we got invited to WOMAD, so the stages were getting bigger. Uh, proper musicians on every stage, tens of thousands of people. For some reason, we there as well. We really love our rehearsals. In fact, I think sometimes we love the rehearsals more than the gigs. It's the highlight of my week, and I think it's true for a lot of the other guys too. The songs we sing, they've lasted the test of time. They're the songs of the folk, the people of Russia. We try and recreate this passion of the Russians. We bring for you only songs of despair and suffering to fill your hearts with love and joy. Hello. Hello. By the end of it, everybody dancing and behaving in quite a silly fashion. But also, I think everybody sees that we respect the music deeply. The Russians started to notice us and we were really nervous about whether they'd like us or hate us. But everyone go, oh, Dostoevsky, I know that Russian writer boy. And we go, no, it's Dusty Fridge for beer, like icebox. Very good. And the Russian ambassador come along with his entourage. If you look under Bond villain on Wikipedia, there is a picture of him. That is what he looks like. He's a beautiful man. So he loves it. His wife loves it too. русских мотивах на австралийский лад Павел Матвей. Out of the blue, TV One, which is like the you know, Russian version of the ABC, did that little spot at the end of the news. А в Австралии сердца слушателей покоряет коллектив, который исполняет песни на. And suddenly, my phone started getting like messages from Russia in the middle of the night. I was like, what's going on? And eventually we found out that, you know, we'd been shown all over Russia all day at the end of every newscast. <laughs> Russians are moved by it and they're reminded of how rich their culture is and they easily accept what we do as a compliment. We're not interested in politics. We do not endorse any political system or government. Uh, we invite uh, President Putin to come to Malamgrad and to sing with us, to go fishing with us, to drink with us, and we hang out in the river together. We take off our shirts and cover ourselves in macadamia butter and see what happens. Uh, uh, hey! Uh, Come it's Wensky. Glensky, elbows. I want to hug you. <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> Why not? Uh, hey, today's the day, man. I know, the 5th of May. 
we'd be in the motherland. I know, I don't know. We'd always wanted to go to Russia, but uh, it's so hard to organise anything with 28 guys. It's like herding cats. I mean, there's no way it's going to happen. Eventually, we get the phone call. It's the Russian Ministry of Culture. We want you guys to come to Russia to sing for the reg uh, regiment of the immortal soldiers for the Grand Victory Day Parade in Red Square. <laughs> and we're like, here we go. 250,000 people and Putin and the tanks and all the stuff. They were going to invite 28 men to travel all the way around the world for four minutes. And we said most of men not last that long, but we give it a crack anyway. All the crew from Dostoevsky should have been on a plane pretty well right now flying to Russia, and then COVID hit, so it was cancelled. Bloody COVID got in the way, didn't it? And so Russian TV invited them to put a clip together. They just did it on their iPhone, all in different locations of where they are in isolation. COVID-19 uh, is terrible shadow, but also an opportunity, and it brings us together. We are ridiculous enough as it is, but we all sing together alone in shipping container. It's beautiful and ridiculous, and it sounds good. Amazing. Why yet? How do you say viral in Russian? Millions of people have watched it, and I've been getting hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of comments from Russian people saying, you guys are amazing, this is incredible, you're beautiful. Like, we've had so many responses on, on uh, Facebook Messenger from people in Russia. <laughs> and then this one's just come back. A choir in Russia has recorded Walsing Matilda in response to what we did for them in Russia. Except they're really good. <laughs> Yes, we can hear you. Instead of the concert that we were going to sing at, they've asked me and one other member of the choir in a COVID-friendly fashion to appear with the anchor man of this program uh, singing with him <laughs> on the telly. Now I'm really scared. OK, OK, when you're ready, guys. OK. A poli tanki grakotali, soldati shi flosleni boy a moladova kamandira. Dostoevsky Choir, their performance is going to be a part of our special Night of May Victory Day coverage. It's going to build up their their fame even more. They've since indicated that they will go ahead with the celebrations for Victory Day, but just at a later date. So there's hope. We might end up in Russia. <laughs> <laughs> well, well done, boys. I really hope Dostoevsky do get to go to Russia because I feel like that's the next part of their story. This is going to be extraordinary for them to take that next jump and really feel what it's like and the emotional connection of singing these songs that don't belong to them, to people who own these songs. They are songs that the Russians have stopped singing. And to us, there is something amazingly beautiful about helping people rediscover their own culture. The accidental nature of the whole thing has been a really fantastic journey, not just for me, but for everybody. The songs of Russia are actually the songs of entire world. 
That is the lesson, if you want one, of Dostoevsky, that there is no particular culture. There is just this song, and it holds all of us within it. Robin and I, we've worked together as a writing, directing, producing partnership for 20 years. Oh, is she the conjoined twins, Doctor? <gasps> Not you too. We've made a bunch of shows like Upper Middle Bogan and The Librarians. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> what was... Jordan and Brooke. Wayne and I were working on a new series together and we were planning to maybe head off in March to LA to try and sell it and then the pandemic hit. And then maybe that's something to do with all the people around us, costume designers, makeup artists, writers, producers, nobody had a job. And that is how the little ogre came to live on a swamp with a beautiful princess. I was playing the role of Princess Fiona in Shrek the Musical, both in Sydney and then here in Melbourne. And we didn't actually realise at the time that Sunday, the 15th of March, ended up being our last show, because then the next day we were told that all the theatres had been closed. Those first few days, everything was so different and uncertain. I was having trouble sleeping. I just had this idea that I was smashing out that was just a rom-com set completely in isolation and filmed completely in isolation. I started to think, we could do that. I think this could happen. I love rom-coms. It's my favourite genre. And I've been wanting to work with Robin Butler and Wayne Hope for a really long time. I can't believe you would do that. Bring our family back together? I know. What a monster. We'd worked together back in, I think, 2014. Yes, that's why she's here. And I think Lucy, you know, she does look up to them professionally and personally. And I think she aspires to, to you know, to, to live the, the sort of life that they lead. They're their own rom-com. Karen's one of those people that, um, that everyone goes, oh, you should be an actress. Wayne and I met in 1998 on the set of a show that I co-wrote called Small Tales and True. Like at school, she had the lead in the, um, in the... In the what was Pirates it? Pirates of Pendleton. I remember thinking, wow, that Wayne Hope's a good actor. He's really good. Don't tell him. He won't see this bit, will he? That's, yeah. I knew you would. I told you you would. I got a job acting alongside her, playing her husband, and... Our relationship was supposed to be in trouble. At the time, we thought it'd be good for Karen's depression, but... Um... But I was thinking, she's lovely, completely lovely. That's true. I, I did get really depressed after the show. Falling in love snuck up on me. I wasn't, I wasn't planning to do that. But we were just kind of kindred spirits, and I couldn't help it. Mm -hmm. isolation I think it was about week four of lockdown and our friend Lucy Durack rang Robin with the idea to do an isolation romantic comedy. Robin was like, I think we, we need to do this quickly. I was terrified that suddenly we'd make it and the world would be free and no one would want to watch a stupid show about being locked down anymore. So that pressure was real. Three days later, she emerges still in her pajamas, hasn't showered, uh, pretty rank, to be honest. And she's got a bunch of scripts in her hand and she's written the whole six parter. And, you know, then I have to work out a way to make it. <laughs> so I set about researching YouTubers and how they film themselves. Stay in the obvious. So Love in Lockdown is about two unlikely people, Ned and Georgie, who are very different, who meet over online ukulele lessons and ultimately fall in love. Oh, hello, I'm Georgie. 
Oh, hi, Georgie. Lucy said to me, what about Eddie perfect for this role? Sorry about you. And he said, yeah, great. Uh, here's the 88 plus uh, microphone itself. It does come with a nice... I made up these little kits, which consist of a tripod with an arm on it. They look like little robots with a light, and then you screw your, your, your phone in sideways and then plug a little microphone into the top. Testing one, two. I sent one to Lucy in Melbourne and sent another kit to Eddie in Sydney um, with an instruction manual. OK, here's how to film yourself. This is the um, rig that Wayne had researched that you chose. Lucy would use her iPhone and film all of her scenes alone in the office in our house. And then Eddie was doing the same thing. He was filming his scenes on his iPhone um, in his bedroom. Scene four, take this is three. one. Scene four, take three. Action. And then Wayne would then pick through all of the takes. And this grabbing lunch this is tough. And they'd have earphones in, talking to each other on another phone, Sydney, Melbourne. Five, four, four three, three, two. two. They'd have to clap at the same time so we can sync the sounds. Loneliness, Jesus, isn't that what makes us human? And then we had this great day where Eddie and I were like right in the pocket of it and we were feeling really good and we recorded the last three episodes and we were feeling so proud of ourselves. And then the next day I wake up and Wayne was like, oh, the sound from your th all three of your episodes didn't work. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm the worst. Lucy's home life is chaotic. She has got the four-year-old, the eight-month-old and a husband. He's a dancer, choreographer, and he's had to move his lessons at home. And she somehow managed to make it work. Hello? Ah, hi. So, love in lockdown. It does have a happy ending, because I think all rom-coms should. Why, why are you outside at my house? In the final episode, Eddie's character comes to visit Lucy's character unannounced. Hi. Hello. Eddie's wife, Lucy Cochran, she recorded Eddie and then Wayne recorded me. The phone the holder, in. it's Flash. hiding your letterbox because there's two letterboxes. Yes. But it was really fun and I kept saying to Robin and Wayne, please come inside, it was really cold. And they're like, no, 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 we're staying outside. We're staying within the rules. I just want to get a little bit of you guys. Hi. <laughs> Brilliant. And there's my husband. It was pretty, pretty awesome because the, the background in Eddie's shot is him in Sydney, but Wayne edited it together so that it looked like, you know, Eddie was there at uh, Lucy's front door in Melbourne. What do I do? Yeah, see, I have to disagree. About what? That is definitely a love song. I think doing this made us feel quite in love with each other. And it wasn't just the, the story. Wayne and I felt like we were in our 20s again. It felt as liberating as just being a couple of kids that went, let's just make something. <laughs> I can't even make my own show work. The whole series from go to woe was written, recorded and edited in 17 days. And then we released it online. I'll be honest, I'm a, I'm a little bit nervous. Within an hour, people are feeding back to you, going, oh my God, I love this, it's so nice. This is your favourite piece of directing. I would love the opportunity to see what happens to these characters. But I think because we're not in lockdown anymore, it would end up being something quite different, which, which could definitely work. I definitely think there's possibility for it. Never. I would never do it again. Um, no, of course I would do it again. But everyone's going, everyone's going series two, series two, going, that would mean another pandemic. Of course I'm not going to say there's a series two. That would be terrible. No. One. One pandemic, one romantic comedy. You come home late and you come home early. You come home it was very clear that the world was starting to change really rapidly. And the unfortunate thing was that 
2020 was so beautifully planned. <laughs> it was really, it was, it was going to be a corker. We had some great, uh, some great gigs in there before it was all ripped out from under us. <laughs> what in the world? We've never not worked, and sort of having that taken out, you're in shock. I, I really thought that music was a, an essential part of the way that this culture runs. So it was hard to to take that on and say, well, I'm not essential, I, I've been asked to stay home. Well, I've been performing, I've been on stage since I was 14. A ray of sunlight shines on everything. We know no other way. Being on stage is a way of life for us. Mm -hmm. We even fell in love on stage. Oh, darling. We got married as soon as we possibly could on the 2nd of February 2018, which was pretty much the first day that you could get married as a same-sex couple in Australia. Woohoo! <laughs> Batman made a promise. Since we met, we've just been together the whole time. We tour together. We just support each other and are together really all the time. It's as cheesy as it sounds. <laughs> <laughs> Then he told her what to do. 13th of March, in fact, Friday the 13th, mm. <laughs> was the last time that we performed in front of an audience and uh, we haven't been able to since. Oh, we won't be doing that. We're still getting a show a day in the future cancelled. Cancelling all that. Would have been very easy for us to sit around and feel sorry for ourselves. But lazy is not sexy. And no. <laughs> neither of us are lazy. We employ many musicians, so there is a swag of, of people that I know that live from gig to gig. And, you know, whilst we may have, you know, some savings that we can live off for a little while, I know some of these musos would be just lost. I said to Libby, I've just found what we're doing throughout this crisis. <laughs> we're not going to sit down and twiddle our thumbs. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Are you there? I knew that I wanted to do something to, to make sure that we could at least, you know, get a, a week's worth of food in their fridge. And to do that, the only outlet we've got, obviously, is social media and to be able to do a show online. I was looking at you before, Libby, going, you look really nice. Have more makeup for about three weeks. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> One, two, three, four. Our fans, they got on board straight away because so many people are wondering how to help anyway. A huge shout out to Belinda and family in Oruru, who, wait for it, bought $500 worth of tickets. Through the two online concerts that we've done so far, we raised almost $14,000. Then we heard on the radio that relief centres around Australia had suddenly tripled in clientele. People saying, mm. I need to feed my family. And I was driving along in tears, listening. Got a car absolutely jam-packed full of goods. So we incorporated that into our online concerts and the money that we raised, and we were able to give away 100% of everything that we that we raised. Okay. Wow. Wow, look at that. Oh. That's extraordinary. We felt so encouraged when they said what we had dropped off had helped 150 separate families. They yeah. made us feel really good and... I'm getting emotional. <laughs> and um, and uh, it, I think it just made us feel really proud of the people that donated as mm. well, you know. Puzzles. I wonder if I could be paid to be a professional puzzler. We're seeing the restrictions slowly lifting, which no, is no. incredibly encouraging. Please don't jam them in like that. As yet, the musicians are still, we're still in the same position. It goes there. Does it? The PM said that the first things to be taken out are the last ones to be put back. Where did you put it? It's just so, so fortunate for us that we've got this other way of touring and doing music. A couple of years ago, we started a bit of a side business and it was an idea that I had because I love camping. We take people in their caravan. We take up to 40 vans with us and we'll go out for two weeks somewhere in Australia. We try and visit towns that people wouldn't normally go to 
to help support local businesses in, in these small country towns. Here in South Australia, we are permitted to have a small gathering in an outside area. And we are really hoping that we are able to continue our music and camping tours um, probably before we're able to, to do our concert shows. Wine time, gin green bottles I've had some wonderful satisfaction of getting up and dressing up and being a superstar on a stage in front of great crowds. But there is something so incredibly special that is, has crawled into my heart about doing it around a campfire yeah. to a small group of people. I'm, I'm kind of edging towards loving that the most at this point in my life. Under the stars, with people, around a campfire, a few red wines, I mean, it is really <laughs> sensational. One of the reasons why we were meant to be together, I think, is to do this kind of thing together. <laughs> this is where I'm currently making the last leg from. Uh, I came back to Australia, I couldn't get back to the UK, so they brought the last leg to me. This is my carport. I get up at 2am on a Saturday morning to rehearse the show in here at 3am. I checked last week, it was four degrees because it's open to the elements. Uh, the sun comes up around quarter to seven. We do the show at seven, which means the birds are squawking and if it rains, it rains on a tarpaulin. Over here is where my co-hosts appear, one in London, one in Huddersfield. Uh, this is the wardrobe department. This is the hair and makeup department, which as you can see, I've done myself. Unfortunately, the props department decided that my garage didn't look Australian enough, so they've aussied it up, including Shrimp on the Barbie. I'm kind of appalled, but this is the whole new world we have to live in. <laughs>